Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, using scripture to prove that hell is not eternal. No one will spend an eternity in hell. It turns out it's all a big misunderstanding. And in this video, I'm going to use the King James Version of the Bible as well as the concordance in order to prove it. We're going to be looking at the scriptures that talk about the so-called eternal punishment or the eternal judgment. And we're going to be looking at the concordance at where they're getting that all from. And then we're going to look up the Greek words that was used to prove that hell is not eternal. It's not an eternal damnation. But first, we're over here in the Third Testament of the Bible, which is where this all started. In one of our recent videos, we were looking in chapter 38 of the Third Testament of the Bible, which is all about the three testaments of the Bible. You've probably heard of the Old Testament and the New Testament, where it turns out there's actually three testaments to the Bible. There's what we know now as the Third Testament of the Bible. And in that series, we were talking about why we have three testaments, where they came from, who wrote them, their significance and importance of the Third Testament. And toward the end of that mini series, it started talking about why people are rejecting the Third Testament. And one of the verses was this one here, verse 33, which talks about the confusion that arose from misinterpretations of the Old and the New Testament. It says that these people who had misinterpreted the scripture had went on to impose their analogies on humanity. In other words, they taught misinterpretations and adulterated form of the scripture. And then it goes on to talk about how this third testament of the Bible is here to clear up some of this confusion, actually shine light on the darkness of those misinterpretations. Like, for instance, the ones we're talking about in this class which will not only include hell lasting for an eternity, but we're also going to be touching on reincarnation, resurrection, and praying for our departed loved ones. This all is coming from a comment that we recently got on these subjects, but we're going to use that comment in order to prove exactly what it's saying here in the Third Testament and how there are those who are rejecting the Third Testament because it does not meet the criteria or is not in agreement with what people have come to understand from the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, because the Third Testament doesn't agree with their misinterpretations, instead of correcting themselves and stop leaning on their own understanding, there are many who are rejecting the Third Testament as if the scripture is somehow in error, as if somehow they are smarter than the word of God and can use their own judgment to discredit the third testament because it doesn't live up to what they think, feel and believe. It says back in verse 31 of this same chapter that these people are blinded by their misinterpretations which is causing them to have a hard time finding the truth in the third testament of the Bible. But anyway, let's get on with it. We're looking over here at the comment. And normally I like to address one subject at a time in our videos. So in this one, like I said, I'm going to be focused in one area and I may end up doing a full video to cover the other subjects that he brings up in his comment. Like this, what he talks about speaking to the dead. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and read it. It says the third testament is definitely something I am trying to get discernment on. And by that, I'm assuming that he's saying he's trying to understand if it is legitimate or not. He goes on to say it talks of speaking to the dead and reincarnation and hell, just to name a few differently than the two errors. He says, scripture does say, do not speak to the dead and that hell was for eternity. 
But then we are told somewhat differently in the Third Testament, as with some other topics. I do get that it says we are not ready for this gospel, the third, and as well, they adulterated the word. But in the scripture, we are also told not to believe any other gospel as well, and that the enemy walks around as an angel of light, that hell was for eternity where the worm would not die. It wasn't just something everyone would get saved from. Just trying to weigh all things. Let me know if you have anything. Well, I actually have a lot here. We've actually done several classes on reincarnation. And what it boils down to is that the Catholic Church under Emperor Justinian actually changed the words in the Bible. Like I said, we've done many classes on this and many studies, but this is why Christians don't believe in reincarnation today. It's not that it's not real. Reincarnation is absolutely real. But they changed all of the words in the Bible from reincarnation to resurrection. So this is why there are many who believe that the dead are going to come up out of the graves. That's why there are those people who are actually preparing for zombie warfare, buying much ammunition, ready to shoot down the zombies of the apocalypse. It's because our Bibles were changed again. Like I said, they took out the word reincarnation and actually put the word resurrection in the Bible. But you can check out some of the other videos we did on that. Like I said, I want to focus on one area. In this particular video, which is on hell being an internal punishment. But before we get into that, let's briefly look at what he's talking about here about the Bible saying not to speak to the dead. That's actually not true at all. What the Bible tells us to do is not partake in necromancy or fortune telling or interpreting omens or sorcery or the charming of spirits or any of those other things that are considered an abomination to the Lord. The scripture doesn't talk anywhere about speaking to the dead. It's more talking about allowing the dead to talk to us. This is considered necromancy, which is the practice of magic or black magic involving communication with the dead by summoning their spirits as apparitions or visions or by resurrection for the purpose of divination. We're actually given an example of this in the Bible back in first Samuel in chapter 28, when King Saul called on one of these medians in order to summon the spirit of Samuel. She was able to go into the spirit well and somehow bring Samuel back so that he could talk to Saul and give him instruction. Well, that's considered necromancy. But this is not what the Third Testament is talking about. It's not talking about praying to the dead or opening up communication with the dead. It's actually talking about praying for them praying that they would have a smoother transition through the spiritual valley that we all end up in when we die. We learn in the third testament of the Bible that it's a place of confusion and darkness. And unless you've been trained on what to do when you die, chances are you're going to be lost for a little while. And this be the case for many of our loved ones who have passed on without getting any instruction on how to make the transition are now trapped in the spirit world. And turns out we can help them by simply praying for them, praying to our father that he would actually help them in their time of need. It's a way of performing charity for our absent brothers. And it talks about how they can hear us when we pray for them. But the difference between that and what our commenter is talking about is we're still not allowed to hear from them. It's just a one way communication to our father as we try to help our loved ones that are in the spirit world. So it's a little bit sad that our commenter is confusing that with necromancy. 
or witchcraft to pray for his loved ones that are trapped in the spiritual valley, especially when the third Testament says that when he reaches the spiritual valley, they were going to question him on why he didn't help them, why he didn't pray for them. And what it boils down to is a misinterpretation, an error in his analysis, confusing praying for our departed loved ones as necromancy or witchcraft. That's what the Third Testament is talking about when we're basing its truths on the criteria of our misinterpretations. But anyway, let's get into the heart of this video, which is about hell being eternal. That's why I really only like to talk about one subject in the video, because there were some who came looking for a reason to discredit the Third Testament of the Bible and have found that reason even before we get into the meat of the video. But you know what they say, haters are going to hate. No matter what we say, no matter how much truth we present to them, they're looking for a reason to discredit the scripture, justifying in their lifestyle of unrighteousness. And for that reason, they are turned over to delusion. Wisdom is timid, like we learned in the first few chapters of Proverbs. She's not going to force herself on anybody. And if you like mistruths, wisdom is going to go somewhere else and hang out. But anyway, let's jump over here and let's look at a couple of websites that talks about is hell eternal? Like, for instance, GotQuestions.org. And we're going to look at a few other websites just looking for verses that they pull out on the subject. I went down through the verses looking for the ones that they mention that talk about hell being eternal. Like, for instance, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, which in the ESV says, Then he will say unto those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, Notice that this translation does say eternal fire. Matthew chapter three calls it an unquenchable fire, which is not quite the same, but we can see the relationship between unquenchable and eternal. And then you have Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, which says, and the devil who had deceived them were thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. And then we have several verses that talk about eternal life. But those are the few from GotQuestions.org that talk about hell being eternal. And then we see them also used in Christianity.com on the subject, why is hell eternal? But it's the same verses used in Crosswalk.com and Christians want to know dot com. So as it turns out, there are very few verses in the entire Bible that talks about hell being eternal. There's Mark chapter three and verse 29 that talks about eternal damnation. There are plenty of verses on eternal life, but there's very few that talk about judgment, like in Hebrews chapter six and verse two. And then we have to go all the way to the book of Jude to find another verse that we could use in this subject. And that's verse seven that mentions eternal fire. And then we have the other verse from Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. But let me show you how these are actually related. When we look up Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, and we look at the end of the verse that talks about forever and ever. We don't see that in the Strong's Concordance. What we actually see is ages of the ages. It says they will be tormented day and night to the ages of the ages, where the King James Version said forever and ever. But notice here the word in Greek is Strong's number 165 which to me seems like it's pronounced eon, which means a space of time or an age. So that's why the Strong's Concordance says ages of ages instead of forever and ever. 
Well, those aren't the same thing. An age is not infinite. Eternity is infinite. But an eon only lasts for a set period of time, just like this eon, which definition is a space of time or an age. So that's actually a misinterpretation. To say forever and ever is not actually correct. It should say more like the Darby translation, which says ages of ages, or the voice, which says throughout the ages, or the Wycliffe translation, which says worlds of worlds, or the Young's literal translation, which says ages of ages. Well, let's look at some of these other passages that talks about hell being eternal, like Mark 3 and 29. When we look at the concordance, we don't see forever or eternity or anything like that. We also see Strong's 165, which says age. When we look at the concordance for the word eternal, we see Strong's number 166, which is another form of the word eon or aeon, saying age long. But notice that its root word is the same as what we saw in Strong's number 165, which is Aeon. Notice that Aeon doesn't use the word eternal, but only says a space of time or an age. And even though it is the root word of Aeonios, the translators chose to put eternal there. Instead of saying a period of time, they chose eternal, which would imply eternity. So what we were being told is that this punishment period, this fire, this judgment would last for a very long time. But what we're not being told is that hell is eternal. That's actually a misinterpretation. So as it turns out, the translators of the King James Version and many of the other translations took the word eon and translated it to eternal, which is not the same at all. But when you look at Romans chapter 20, you find something else very interesting. And that is down where it's talking about eternal power. It doesn't use Strong's number 165 or 166, but we see Strong's number 126, which is an entirely different word altogether. Pronounced something like Aedios or something like that. But notice that it is eternal or everlasting. But this verse is not talking about heaven or hell or eternal life, but it's talking about the eternal power of the Godhead, the everlasting power of our father. And we know for sure that it is eternal. It's never going anywhere. We know for sure that his power is infinite. But notice when they talk about his infinite power or his everlasting power. There's a whole different word there altogether that doesn't sound like or look like eon at all. And the reason why is because it's not talking about the same thing. Now, in this verse, we're actually talking about something that's infinite, something that is eternal, something that will last forever. And that's why there had to be a different word. And why wasn't that word used to describe hell? Because hell is not eternal, turns out. And we learn this in the third testament of the Bible. This book is clearing up many misinterpretations like this. I mean, it wasn't our commenter's fault that the translators chose to use eternal when describing the torments or the punishments, just like it wasn't his fault that the translators used resurrection instead of reincarnation. But it is his fault if he rejects the Third Testament, which is actually clearing all of that stuff up. Without the Third Testament, many people are leaning on these misunderstandings, like what we learned about heaven and hell, which turns out to be way different than they taught us. We see that in chapter 27 of the third testament which is about the beyond there's a whole section in there that talks about heaven and hell and what it actually is it goes into great detail explaining what heaven is and what hell is 
And it turns out all of those pictures that they tried to paint for us of this place burning in fire is not true. That fire, that pain that we will feel will actually be our conscious bearing down on us, reminding us of the wrongs we've done here on the planet and why we fell short. That's going to be a period of torment on our spirit, not a fire on our flesh, which will not go into hell. All this information is found in this book for all that want to know the truth. But look at how many are rejecting this truth, rejecting this wisdom because it doesn't match up with their interpretations. Well, here we've learned in this video a clear example on how we need the Third Testament in order to clear up these misinterpretations. The King James Version and many of the other translations one could read that hell is eternal. But we learn in the Third Testament of the Bible that nobody will spend eternity in hell. Matter of fact, let me read chapter 11, verse 95, which says, Know that if even one of my children is still found outside New Jerusalem, there will be no celebration, for God will not be able to speak of triumph. He cannot celebrate if his power has not been able to save even the last of his children. So all of his people will get to see New Jerusalem. Nobody will spend eternity in hell. Let me read a few more of these verses, like chapter 42 and verse 4, which says, Do not forget that if I have come to tell you that none of you will be lost, it is also true that I have said that every debt must be settled and every fault erased from the book of life. It is up to you to choose the path to me. Free will is still yours. So this is what they're doing to us when they try to convince us that hell is eternity. They're leaving out the part that we can actually make up for our debts and we don't have to spend time in hell. In other words, there are millions of people who have condemned themselves to an eternity of hell. And so they say, what's the use of even trying to do good? Well, again, nobody is going to spend eternity in hell, but everybody is going to make up for the wrongs that they have done one way or the other. Their stains, all of our stains will have to be removed from the book of life. The thing about it, if we don't do it in this lifetime, then we'll have to do it in the spirit world where our conscience will act like a hell burning on our spirits. Now let's drop down to chapter 49 and let's look at verse 6, which says, No one shall be lost. Some shall arrive earlier on the road I have shown you, while others come later on the roads that they are following. In other words, the ones who have chosen a life of disobedience, a life of unrighteousness, will have to go through the spiritual valley in order to be cleansed of their stains, while the ones of us who in the flesh have repented will get to see the kingdom of heaven, while those who get taken away will have to spend some time in the lake of fire before they get to return and see that kingdom of heaven. So nobody will get lost. It's just some people are going to take the long way around. But before I go, let me go ahead and address this last concern that he speaks of talking about any other gospel as if the third Testament is teaching another gospel. He's getting that from verses like Galatians chapter one and verse nine, which is talking about if any man preach any other gospel. And when we look at the Strong's, we see number 2097 which in Greek seems to be pronounced euangelizo. But what it's talking about is the good news. We see that in Strong's number 2098, euangelion, which is talking about the good news of the coming of the Messiah. That is the gospel. That's what gospel means. Well, that is exactly what the Third Testament is doing. It's not talking about a new gospel or the coming of a new Messiah is speaking on the coming of the one Messiah and giving us clarification 
on how his return will actually be. Turns out there's been another misinterpretation. Some believe that he's coming in the flesh as a human and all kinds of misinterpretations are being cleared up by the third testament of the Bible, which confirms what John said, that the return will be in spirit. We see some of that clarification over in chapter two and verse six, where he describes how he returned spiritually contained in a ray of light. So there is no new gospel. We're just being educated on what the true gospel is. So let me close out with this verse from chapter seven of the third testament of the Bible. Verse 39, which says, do not be disturbed when they tell you that he who has spoken to you during this period has been the tempter and that it was foretold that he would also perform miracles with which he would perturb and confuse the very chosen ones. Truly, I tell you that many who think in that way about my manifestation will be those who who actually are in service of evil and in darkness, although their lips try to assure you that they are always speaking the truth. So when somebody comes and try to tell you that the third testament is deception or is not true or is not of our father or anything like that, understand who these people are. Some of them are just confused and some of them are new to the scripture and they'll catch on eventually. But some of these people are actually in service of evil and in darkness, even though they try to act like they're the ones speaking the truth. But we recognize the tree by its fruit. So let's go on. So that's three reasons that our commenter has given as to why he doesn't believe in the third testament. But we've proven all three wrong here now. And again, this is why we need the third testament of the Bible, because there's many confusions like this, many misinterpretations, many misunderstandings that we have been living with all of this time. But praise our father in heaven. We do have the third testament of the Bible, which is allowing the truth to finally come to the light, at least for those who want to see it. If you got any other questions or concerns or anything, please put them in the comment section below and I'll see you down there.